The Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. Becoming a member at Navy Federal can help you earn more and save more. You can learn all about this at NavyFederal.org. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. As always, thank you guys for listening and watching, and please don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button wherever you get your show. So today, before we get to our special guest, let's kick it off with our weekly Patreon question of the day. Today we've got, what is your favorite home-cooked meal from mom? Hmm. You're staring me down. I am, yeah, like, what have I made <laughs> you? Your mom is sitting right here. Your mom is right here. Yeah. I know. Well, something and that... my mother listens to this, so I'll, you know, I better make sure I... Um, something that I would absolutely love right now, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's that soup that you make. Um, soup of Toscana. Yes, he knew exactly which one it was. Yeah. That it's really is, it is good. absolutely delicious. Marcus took over making that because he's got an Instant Pot. He loves the Instant Pot. Um, but I make it slow in the old school, regular, old yeah, school yeah, pot. Old school. And uh, yeah, hunters always love that. Mm -hmm. All right. What about you? Probably chili. You know, my mom, she'd make chili. She'd take like everything in the refrigerator and just put it into the thing and just cook it for like a couple of days. And half the time you just had, you know, it was good. I love it. Yeah, no choice but to say it was good too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back then, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what happened. Like, there's an imprint of certain foods that your mother makes. Yeah. And when we go out and especially the travel the world the way we do and have to eat and all the places we have to do, you run across the same dish made by somebody else. You can really taste it. Yeah, absolutely. I noticed that same thing. My mother makes a prime rib Ooh. only on Christmas. Nice. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. actually in a cookbook. Uh, Steve Ducey from Fox and Friends in yeah. the morning. He cooking came, with friends. Uh, happy something. In a hurry, happy in a hurry cookbook. Happy in a hurry cookbook. Sorry, Steve. Steve. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, it's a cookbook, and he has several different additions to it. But one of them, he has Mama Luttrell's prime rib in there. And we get calls it's all the, the time saying, "I made the the prime rib." So good. It's so good. Only once a year. It's I'm so, gonna get it. I, I, I would want to eat it all the time. It's one yeah. of those deals, but I, I that's that's willpower right it's there. It's so yeah. good. It actually turned a vegan back to a car. Yeah, there was witnesses to that. Yeah, because the way it smelled. Yeah, yeah. Just because of the way that damn thing smelled when he was walking through the house, he was like, "Well, you know, yeah. I haven't had. I've never eaten." We had a photographer out here, and he was a straight up vegan. Looked like a vegan. And he looked like a <laughs> he, <laughs> he looked like one. Wearing yeah. Vans and yeah. Stuff. He, he played the part great. Looked yeah. the whole like he looked everything. Looked super the part skinny, everything. and he he said, you know, I don't eat meat, but what's that smell? And I'm like, that's Mama's prime rib, and it was like, I mean, in his everything. And right, he said he he walked out and he was about to leave, and then he turned back because she kept offering it to him. And he's like, no, I don't eat meat. I don't eat meat. He came back in and said, do you mind if I have one bite? He gave in. <laughs> and then he takes a bite temptation. and ends up asking for a to-go yeah. plate. <laughs> <laughs> to-go plate. He and probably had a coma after he had Oh, yeah, yeah man. The meat like, oh. sweats, dude, behind the knees and the eyelids are sweating. Oh, I can't yeah. imagine his bathroom stopping oh, yeah. coming back. Because if it's you just worth it. meat. That should be a, <laughs> it's completely you worth it. a t shirt right yeah. there. Yeah. It's yeah. completely so worth good. it, man. I think that's going to be on her tombstone. Uh, that's awesome. I turned a vegan into a carnivore. Or the prime rib. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to have to get that recipe. That's my mother. She was the prime rib. She also makes some mean fried chicken. And the rolls. She makes only on Thanksgiving. Oh, she makes these rolls. His mom rolls. is an amazing cook, which is yeah, really his... hard to follow a woman like that. Mm -hmm. Like, for me. Pressure's on. Okay, so I, I didn't think. Okay, bro. I didn't. That thought didn't even cross my mind when I got married. And, mm -hmm. my, you know, I was like, my mother has to live right next door. So I didn't put the food war thing together. Mm -hmm. But it's not a war. I want her to do all of it. I am not. I'm not trying to take it over. I'm mm -hmm. like, you do it. You you do you. You keep feeding your son. She cooks great, too, though. That's the problem, man. Mm, but I don't cook like your mom does, and she's an amazing cook. No one ever will. That's what I was talking about earlier. Whatever your mom, when you come up on that, it's yeah. freaking, you can't help it. Yeah, that's a good question, Hunter. Yeah, Everybody's got it. My, oh, my mom, um, I would say I, we're from Louisiana, and we have certain like Cajun staples. She makes 
a rice and gravy that is so freaking mm. good. And she made, which is basically like smothered meat, like a chuck roast or something. And um, she makes a crawfish etouffee that is. Oh, etouffee. Yeah. It's so good. Too, yeah. Real, real, real good. Oh, good. Yeah. So. All right. That's a good question. Yeah. All right, brother. Welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. I, I got a file on you and everything. <laughs> One thing that our listeners love is to run into team guys. Mm-hmm. Like they're just hearing about you, where you're from, and how you're wired. Yeah, right. I mean, from from the littlest things, and you don't put that together when you're in. You don't put it together when you're young or anything like that, man. But if you remember back when we were young, you're always looking for somebody or something to guide you out of whatever it is you're in. Absolutely. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Seals are that. Mm-hmm. It's like as soon as you get the trident pinned on you, it doesn't matter how much you get beat up, what happens to you, just walk tall, have a great attitude. That's what, you remember, know, keep that. Yep. So that that's what a lot of people love to hear about. We're just to start this off, man, before we get into SEAL teams and stuff like that, and what you're doing for a living now, where where are you from? Yeah, so I was born and raised in, in Tampa, Florida. Uh I kinda like lived all over the place, right? So as far as like a one you're specific a am I what? Are you a military brat? No, 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 okay, no. So raised by a single mother, did the best she could. We moved all over. So there's not like one specific place that I think is like my home I recognize Florida as that, right? Uh, so yeah, I grew up, uh, young kid, same old thing, getting into, getting into trouble, right? I didn't have, I didn't have much oversight as a kid, but you know, I've always been fascinated with the military and, you know, men in green faces and, you know, what's going around my neighborhood. I absolutely remember that book. Writing down, writing down license plates, thinking I'm a spy (laughs) when I'm like eight years old, you know? So. Okay. Cause you look just like Jeffrey Donovan, dude. Have you seen Burn Notice? Uh, is that that show down in Miami? Yes, like a, I figured yeah, you yeah. would have seen this. Yeah, that's a good one. He's great. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's freaking good. great, dude. Yeah. That guy, man. And you never, no one's ever thrown that on you. No, they tell me I look like uh, Seth MacFarlane. Uh, I don't know. I don't see that. I don't one, see man, it either. I definitely see some Jeffrey Dahmer, especially when you when you get Jeffrey fired who? up. Jeffrey Dahmer, Donovan. <laughs> oh, Jeffrey. Dahmer. I know. I thought you were saying Dahmer too. I'm no, like, Jeffrey that's Dahmer. A horrible uh, insult. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you are a team guy. You never know. No, Jeffrey Donovan. Yeah. That's his name. Donovan. Yeah, no, Donovan. Yeah, that's okay. a good show. But yeah, so I grew up down there kind of, yeah, just. What anymore. got you into the teams? What was it? Okay, so a lot of people, they didn't know about the SEAL teams. We mm-hmm. used to keep this thing hidden pretty well. Yeah. But then there's some things, like I remember very vividly what it was. There was a, a documentary, The Silent Option, mm-hmm. that guy's voice. Yeah. As soon as it opens up and he he starts talking about that we're cut from a different cloth and get paid to take I mean, I just ate that. I mean, I I heard that. Mm-hmm. And then the movie Navy Seals with Charlie Sheen. That's it. <laughs> Those two things right there, yeah. coupled with my brother leading the charge is what got me in. Mm-hmm. What got you? But you were in from a generation where all the seal stuff was out. You had Marcus's books out, you had uh Chris Kyle's book out. Cause what year did you graduate? Graduated from high school. High school was 2011. Yeah. So yeah, there the marketing side on the Navy was huge. So yeah. all the books came out. I read them all. Your, yours, Jay Resman, Chris Kyle, David Goggins was out there doing. He was a lot, big recruiter uh, for the Navy. I think they were kind of. He was still with his. the Navy. Yeah, yeah. I I got to run with him in prep actually. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you that. I was yeah. like, hey, you ever run across one of us beforehand? And if it was, it was Doc Goggins because he did. He was a recruiter. Yeah, I, I remember that. Yeah, they, he was up in Great Great Lakes uh, right. doing the prep thing. But yeah, so, you know, that was my introduction to it was, you know, that recruitment side. I had family members who were in the teams, too, still in the teams, actually. And You're a legacy? Kind of a distant legacy, yeah. So or Bastards. That's yeah. what they call us, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I kind of always knew what, like, you'd come home, you'd hear stories, like, through the family and stuff. And you're like, man, that is cool. But it was really, um, you know, just I think serving my country was always something I wanted to do. But if I was going to do it, it had to be it, I wanted to do it at, you know, not to say like the hardest thing I could do, but it was the attraction of the SEAL teams. And, you know, did you have what it takes to make it to that training and to be in a group of men like that? Right. Doing what we do uh, was for me, it was like the dream. What, what year was that? Well, how old are you when that started? Uh it, the recruiting side on the Navy, I mean, they were hitting it pretty hard in, in high when I was in high school. So right? started in high school is when you saw it? Yeah, started in high school and that's when I really kinda decided, man, like I wanna be I wanna be a team, I wanna be a frogman. And so like most guys, what do we do? We start 
we tie our hands together, we jump in the pool, thinking that, <laughs> hey, you know, you, you know, we're like, we're that's gonna that's right. he- help us. We start taking cold showers, or I did that uh, too. Yeah, I used to, <laughs> dude. I used to put in earbuds, and you know, David Goggins is waking up at three in the morning to go run. 20 miles or something or 40 miles i'd yeah. be like okay i'm gonna put that in and i'm just gonna go for a run because yeah. you know he is uh he's an amazing human dude and so he's for me in high isn't school, a human we know coggins very well really? on a personal it, level so it, it's, we can attest he is not human yeah <laughs> i remember getting up to seeing like going for jogs and singing cadences that, yeah, yeah. that i thought the seals had done and stuff like that i mean into it just like that like if you if you're out there and you want to be a seal and this stuff's happening happening to you yeah like if it's calling to you like makes you do weird stuff like that mm-hmm. like tie yourself together and throw yourself in a pool by yeah. yourself <laughs> or swim across the lake in your backyard yeah you know like, stuff, like if you're doing weird stuff like that yeah just, you, we're probably your place yeah and we and, and if you tell guys like you know when you're like a high school kid you're like oh yeah i want to Go be. I want to go to Buzz. Try to be a seal. Most people laugh at you. They're like, "Oh, you. sure, sure, you're gonna make it, buddy." Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, But they'll be like, "I'll be like, what should I do to prepare? Like, should I be taking cold showers all the time?" They're like, "No, nah, you don't need to do that." But for me too, it was a big part of like when you see the the evil of you know you know nine eleven and those kinds of things. You know, I was I was really young when that happened, but you you still want to kind of get a piece of the revenge factor. And so for me, I knew that there was this unfathomable evil that existed in this other part of the world, and I knew that brave men were going to those areas to confront that, right, to keep us safe. And for me, that was something that I wanted to be a part of, you know. Uh, and I figured, you know, like when I went to Buzz, dude, I was like, I'm not, I will never quit. Like, you can kill me. In well, this what was that pool. like when you checked out? I mean, because had you been anywhere before So I, the Navy? Did you travel at all or did y'all stay uh, like in town? No, so I, I had a... I was a little bit of a troublemaker in high school, and I got a really good mentor. We all are. Yeah, yeah. So I got a really good mentor who came were. into my life. Yeah. And uh, that, so then I kind of like had this weird thing where I dropped out of high school, then I dropped back in because I had a good mentor, helped get me through. He helped get me into college, actually. And then I got I got to college, and I was like, I don't really want to do this. I want to go join the Navy and try to go become a SEAL. And uh, I ended up getting to college. I graduated like two and a half years, and then I enlisted in the Navy after I got my college degree. And uh, a lot of our guys do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It does. In our community, we have officer enlisted and it's, it's a, it works well together. But the separation between us is just like, hey, we get in trouble, man. The officers have to take the hit. Yeah. Absolutely. You know what absolutely. I mean? I mean, they're educated and they get real educated as they get older, too. That's the thing about them. Like, we've streamlined the system now. If you come in, mm-hmm. but a lot of the guys, so the, the mentor thing's huge. Like, I 100%. had that too, man. Yeah. And it, it and when we say mentors, it's not somebody who's always with you all the time. It's like periodically they'll say, hey, get your ass back in check. Mm-hmm. Or, hey, I think you can do this. And you'd be surprised. It doesn't take that much, especially for guys like us. Mm-hmm. You just needed, to, just needed to hear it from somebody. Yeah. Not not beat me to death with it. I mean, just hear it from somebody is all it takes. Yeah. And we don't think that. We think, you're thinking, oh, i got to put hours and days and weeks into that sucker. Like, no, you don't. No, you, not at all. Matter of fact, all you got all he has to know is that you expect that out of him. Yeah. And we'll do it. Yeah. And that was a cool thing with, with the mentorship side. Even before you join the Navy, the, uh, they have a mentor, like a, another SEAL who brings you up, yeah. kind of puts you through your own crucible, kind of we, weed you out. But yeah, my like my mentor, my first mentor I had was my principal of my, of my high school, right? He's like, he had the, this big sign in his office. He said, don't do dumb things, right? And that's great. Like, as Stand a young ball. kid, yeah, that's yeah. what I, I needed to hear. But, you know, to have that kind of a father figure in your life who kind of helps keep you on the straight and narrow was something that, you know, I'll always be uh, thankful for. And that's why I'm a big believer. And no matter where you are in life, grab a mentor. And then when you get to that place where you think you can give back, be that mentor, right? Yeah. And the cycle takes care of itself. Girl, mm-hmm. I have that sticker in the Jeep says, don't do dumb things. Yeah. Just, really? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. That's crazy. Man. I'd love to send you a picture. <laughs> it, says a, yeah. it says it's simple. Yeah. Because when you get in there, most of the time you're going in to do some dumb stuff. Absolutely. And it's just a constant reminder. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get that. So is your principal? Yeah, it was my principal in high school. Did he? Did you ever reach back? Yeah, you out seen to him since? Have you yeah, that? I reached back to him and I said, "They dig that." Yeah, yeah. Uh, his name was Paul Ott, one of the greatest guys ever. Uh, and he was kind of the person who kind of started to put that seed in you about God and all that. And uh, so I texted him. I've I've kept in touch with him. You always keep in touch with the people who helped you get from mm-hmm. maybe a bad situation through it. And so I I, I texted him a picture, you know, of me. I think I was with. 
doing something, had a big old beard. I say, look where I am now, you know, and he's been following me ever since. And it's, it's cool, right? Because, um, when I get, I'm going to continue that and I hope to be yeah. that, 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 you know, mentor for the next kid up and coming, whether it's in business or joining the military or whatever, uh, because you almost got to pay it forward. Right. Because, um, my life has forever changed because of like just a few mentors I've had. Yeah. One of Marcus's mentors uh, ended up marrying us. That's so, awesome. Yeah, that was like full circle for I'm us. Going fast, sure did. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. It's funny, man, because if you take our guys and throw us in other environments, see people look at us like criminals or low lives or I mean, right? You put yeah. that trident on there, that changes everything. Mm -hmm. Still the same guy. Oh yeah, you go from like you know you got a lot of. When you when you accomplish something like that, you get a lot of it's maybe like like a status, but you get a lot of friends. And then well, it's because they know that discipline and manners and respect come out of that crew. We could be wildlings, everything. We got them. Yeah, dude, we got everything in there. But then if, when people look at him, you see that right, and it means that he you put that sucker down. You know, on a, they can get in line and they can do some awesome stuff together. Yeah, and Absolutely. that in itself knows. I don't care how wild he is, man. He's got some discipline. All he's got to do is give him some direction. Yeah. So did you go through with Justin Hughes? Justin Hughes, the, he, he's an artist. Yes. Yeah, I think he was a little bit uh, before me. Yeah, it's tough to keep up with all y'all now, well, man. Well, the only reason I say that is because, well, what year would you have gone through Buds? 2015, oh, 2016 okay. time frame. I was thinking like 2012 because that's when we actually were at the Buds compound when he was in Buds and Marcus like slipped in and spoke to the class that's cool and, really good thing. yeah um but yeah that would have been before you um, so when you when you what class did you go into 312 312 you started what happened when you got yeah rolled in pool comp and i graduated 313 all right second phase well, well, tell me this man what was it like when you stepped in there the first day was it what you thought is first it like day. like the documentaries in the movie i try and tell people this all the time i was like man you can watch many movies you won't Dude, that intro. When you step in there on that first freaking day and our boys yeah. light into you, God, I'll never forget it. I know it's right. Yeah, I think, you know, I remember co going over the Coronado Bridge for the first time. Right? I remember that too. They pick us up. They pick you up from the airport. You're coming from, you know, Illinois, Great Lakes, and you, you haven't seen the sun in like a month, Forever. and you're pale. Forever. And then you're on the beach in Southern California. You go, you're going over that bridge. Over that you're like, bridge. And you, you're like, oh my looking over the bridge it's the most surreal experience because you're like man i'm i've made it this far right it's you're, almost unbelievable yeah it's like because the dells you can see it. it's all yeah, beautiful yeah, yeah. too it's just like you yeah. can't see us hidden in there that's that was the cool part too you're like oh it looks beautiful here no, yeah and oh, you yeah. get picked up from the airport by like the rollbacks right and these guys are all like tanned up <laughs> yeah, and yeah. they're all jacked because you know whatever. everyone's in shape yeah yeah and then you you get to the compound or i think it was uh you know where the first phase office is and you're going in through the the check-in to then go go to indoc but you see all the the, the bud students that are all tanned and you see the guys who've been through <laughs> hell week and they got their brown shirt and their, Dude, their lips are all chapped they just look hard as yeah they're just like yeah. hard as nails Southern it's, California it's boys. the scariest thing to see yeah. when you first roll in there is a bud student yeah <laughs> g-shock on we're never as tough as that <laughs> Yeah, in my, I mean, in my opinion, man, it's like, dude, when, you, when them suckers are in buds, it's like a canine training unit you can't even fathom. So I, I call it Hogwarts. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Hogwarts. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's no, no, got excuse blonde me. hair. Excuse me, excuse me, not Hogwarts. Frogwarts. Frogwarts. Frogwarts, <laughs> man. It's our own little technical school, yeah. bro. Dude, everybody's got blonde hair. Everyone like has blonde hair. Pool, Everyone like, has like blonde gold. hair. Yeah. It's so fun. Dude. Everyone has the same pair of UD t shirts. They're all the same size. Oh, yeah. None of them fit. Dude, and it's everyone's free. handsome. Oh, yeah. We Beautiful don't take man. ugly guys. Can't be ugly. Yeah. You're like, man. I remember the instructor saying Am I going to beat one of them one day? You know, like, <laughs> what are they going to fill me with? <laughs> we had an ugly guy in my class, and I remember the instructor first phase. First workout, they're like, there's just no way how you think you're going to make it through here. <laughs> yeah. It's like, there's a rule. And I mean, they were real calm about it. You know how they get, right? The instructors, yeah, yeah. when they want to really- like real calm. Real <laughs> calm. Like, ah, oh, dude, you're like, you're real, you're like third world handsome, but not really. You know what I mean? And they just kind of start third hitting them with it. Handsome. Oh, yeah, we don't have any ugly guys. That's part of the, that's part of it. We guard that. Well, Did no. you have any moments in Buds that's like super standout memorable for you? Or Hopefully we can talk about that on this podcast. But uh, I think, you know, Hell Week, Hell Week will always be uh, uh, memorable, right? Uh, I think the funny thing is, is, you know, you're doing like push-ups and some guy's got 
projectile diarrhea and it's you know he, oh, and yeah, he, he it's like it's like fast. driven down his pants and you're going in them you know what i'm saying and the instructors are yelling at you i mean dude it is it's hard to pick out one specific memory there's a couple memories of like right before i blacked out in pool comp you see the instructor coming over to like punch the air out of your lungs that kind of thing but uh i, I dude i hated pool comp yeah what, what was your hardest phase first second third um i think Probably second phase. I had some kind of lung issue. And I couldn't hold my breath a long time. I was I like I couldn't barely hold my breath for twenty seconds. And you, you know, know if you're lung? No, I see. I'm a. I Come on, grew up man. diving. Lie, dude. I grew up diving. Huh? I, I grew up like diving, spear fishing, doing all that stuff. So I prided myself in like I'm gonna get in the water and I'm gonna oh, do. Oh, no, dude, it sounds pretty thin. Okay. And uh, <laughs> but I, yeah, I got some lung thing and I couldn't hold my breath. And when you're doing pool OCA, I'm like you need a good breath hold, right? And so I got I got rolled, blacked out a bunch of times, but uh. Yeah, you don't realize how much of an ass kicking that is. That's probably the most intense thing I've been through. I know it's supposed to simulate surf hits, and it does because mm-hmm. I've caught, been caught in the zone plenty yeah. of times. My instructor gave me full benefit, man. Mm-hmm. That freaking guy was a master at it. Instructor yeah. Calvin, dude, I mean, masterful. Who were some of your instructors that scared the shit out of you? Um, I would say I, they're still in, so I don't know if I want to yeah. get out their their name. That's fine. No, but, you don't uh, do. One of the guys is a well-known group of brothers. He was a uh, oh, I know exactly. What you're talking yeah, about. yeah, I know exactly. He, what you're talking he about. was a hammer, dude, and he it magnificent. Was, yes, dick, dude. That motherfucker <laughs> can be a freaking magnificent asshole. He can be be the what comes what they say, dude, is yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah, and he he was memorable, man. He made it fun, and he. You know, I ha- I love the savageness of it, right? Like the Dude, there's something about some of them guys that can make you laugh while they're like what they're saying is so funny that it, you laugh, but and you're getting pissed, and then at they're the beating same, you for laughing. Be- yeah, yeah. It's a it's a there's no other place like it on the planet of Earth. Yeah, it's one of the you know I'm so I feel so grateful to have been through that training, man, and just like you form some really cool relationships with your guy. Like I still to this day talk to dudes from my you know my boat crew and. And hell we, because it's just like there's that. How many did you graduate with? Bonding. It was. I, it was less than thirty. Yeah. Uh, anybody? Anybody die yet? In training. At wherever. All. Just in your buds classes. Is everyone, everyone still died? alive? Uh, yeah. Everybody still got everybody. I think everybody's still there. Wow. I'm. I'm probably one of the first dudes like out. Right. Wow. I. Uh, not by choice, but. Um, yeah, you won't be the last. Yeah. That's just part of the job. So, and yeah, we'll get into that, but that's the most important thing is keeping that line of comms and, and helping guys, you know, as they come come away from that because filling that void is, Absolutely. is, is hard. It's really hard. The worst thing that happens to us is when they get out, they push out by ourselves. Mm-hmm. Team guys are not designed to survive like that. There's a swim There's a swim buddy thing we got to have. Yeah, yeah. And that should be an assignment when you get out, like, hey, this is your swim buddy for being out. Mm-hmm. Like, until he dies, we'll give you a new one. Until you make your friends. But those guys who get out and get alone, then they get alone. Yeah. So if you went to one, and that was in like 2015, 2016, were you with Josh Wynn? Josh Wynn. I don't... No, he would have been an officer because he was at one. That I don't was remember last... what year it was. Yeah, that was his last thing to do on the West Coast. Um. Anyway, he's one of our close friends, and he's out. He lives here now in Magnolia. Okay, gotcha. so your primary when you were in, what's your job? You're a breacher. Yeah, I was, I was a breacher. Uh, and yeah. How many platoons you do? Just just one. Uh, unfortunately. Then yeah, that's when you got hurt. Yeah. So I had in about a year time frame three per, t- pretty bad TBIs. Uh, guy got in a really bad Humvee accident. Uh, it had a pretty big wall charge, kind of hang fire on me. And then when we were uh, overseas doing some helo casts, I took a Zodiac motor to the head. Dude, I heard a, about that. When they were coming in to, mm-hmm. to land. And, and it was like the, I think too, like the compound effect, right? Uh, and like being kind of that post-concussive syndrome, right? Uh, that kind of, kind of like lost my mind, you know? Um, had a lot of issues, vision, balance. Uh, and... You know, it's weird with traumatic brain injury because you like you can look at yourself and you look fine, but maybe you can't. You know, you, there's all kinds of things you can't see, right? right. Uh, and so, I what I wish I would have done is after that uh, after that Humvee accident, right, taking it upon myself to get the necessary help, right. But I was kind of like, I guess team guys are all like, team guy, push it under the rug, man. Yeah, your team guy, don't keep going. Uh, 
And but I, I really didn't do a good job of taking care of myself, right? And I think wrongfully I was probably I didn't want to leave like the guys, right? You want to always be there. Bro, I get that. Were you married? Yeah, I went through a pretty bad divorce. Okay, so you're a regular team guy. Then. Yeah. Okay. I, look, some of the old timers, like the Chiefs, especially when they tell us certain things and we don't listen, they mm -hmm. say, it. you know, Seal Chief, he's not going to waste his breath on us for no damn reason. Yeah. And like going, going through some of those cycles of life is, is part of being a team guy. Like mm -hmm. you get into that. Yeah. If I could tell the guys are still in one thing, I'm like, don't worry about that, right? And that's part of it. I mean, yeah, we're, we're hollering at you, but that's, you know, it's like a rite of passage for all of us. Mm -hmm. It's like we're one kind of deal. Yeah. It's, if, it's when you, it's as the younger guys get out and they rotate back around, it's incumbent upon us to teach, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be there for them. Yeah. Have you ever Googled yourself and found a little bit more info than you'd like? while well, your personal information is exposed and for sale. Data brokers everywhere are selling your details to scammers, spammers, and anybody willing to pay. That's where Aura comes in, the guardian of your digital privacy. It scans the depths of the internet to uncover whoever is selling your data. And that's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. With Aura, you can take control, wipe out your digital footprint, reduce spam, and shield from hackers. Aura protects against unseen online threats, just one subscription, and countless protections. You may have some protection, but without Aura, it's like leaving the back door wide open. It's always on guard, so you can focus on your life and not any cyber worries. Value your privacy, value mine, safeguard our digital lives. Start your two-week free trial at Aura.com slash TNQ. Stop those data brokers from exposing your personal information. Go to my sponsor at aura.com slash TNQ for a 14-day free trial and see how much of yours is being sold. This is a paid promotion. Offer subject to terms and conditions. Go see our website for details. Absolutely. Is it keeping that pass down kind of kind of going that's how always. we stay alive yeah that's how team guys stay alive man. yeah it's like it's like 50 50 security right like i'm looking after you and you're looking after me therefore 100%. i don't have to look after myself that's right you know what i mean like when as soon as the guys get through buds and get that trident they're part of the fraternity yeah mm -hmm. it's when you're in the teams that you're trying to earn your way out to be a vet yeah which is which is the coolest place to be as a seal it was when you get out mm -hmm. and, and the vietnam guys had it bad but uh, the the storms and the shields started bringing us together, and when the GWATs got back, when my generation got back, man, we pulled everybody together. Mm -hmm. So by the time y'all get out of here, man, y'all are already entrepreneurs and making millions of dollars and <laughs> shit like that. And you, while well, sleeping in a ditch, I mean, I mean, having a great time. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So I, remember, it advances. Yeah. But you were one of the first guys to get out. Yeah, I'm one of the test cases. I freaking yeah. loved it too. Yeah. During well, the <laughs> thing, my thing was, is I went through some really bad times, right? I uh, I lost my, you know, for me the I got my purpose and my paycheck all in one uniform, yeah. right? And when I had issues with my cognitive abilities to where I could no longer continue with the boys and can no longer, uh, you know, be somebody that was a part of the, you know, tip of the spear, right? It was like my whole, my whole life felt kind of worthless, right? And I went to a point where, you know, I had isolated myself from everybody who yep. cared about me. I was jacked up on a ton of pills. Uh, like the, the list was insane. Uh, yep. there was a pill for waking up a pill for going to sleep and there were symptoms from one pill. So they stacked another pill on top of that. And dude, I was like a walking freaking chemistry experiment. Right. And I only got worse. Right. And I only got to the point where I said, you know, if I can no longer like m probably traumatic brain injury, your emotion regulation is, is totally off. But I got to the point where like, I didn't want to live anymore because my purpose I couldn't, I wasn't ever going to find that out there. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't see my family as important, right? I had, I had seen the evil downrange, right? I had watched these, these, these people that they need to be, you know, they need to be killed. Right. And, uh, I had seen service members give their life. And for me, like the first time that you see an American service member who's given his life for freedom with an American flag covering his body coming home and you're standing watch over there over him, right. Or you're doing that ramp ceremony. That American flag means something completely different after you experience that, oh, yeah. right? And 
And so that was where, you know, I, and in a weird way, I kind of became selfish, right? I kind of became, uh, you know, not the, the humble, grateful team guy that I should have been. And, you know, I was, I was a mess, dude. I was, I was drinking pills. Uh, I was full of anger and I walked in freaking, I was just, I hated like life, dude. And as crazy as that sounds, even though I had all these experiences to be grateful for, right? I mean, I, I'm still here. Like I was lucky to survive those events, right? I was, I was able to walk away from those uh, intact, right? And so uh, eventually my story kind of started to shift when I started kind of remembering, right? Remembering the sacrifices, uh, remembering, uh, you know, the, the people that even though I'm, I'm not there, you know, get jocked up and getting on the helo. There's another guy right behind me that's doing that. Who's left his family. Who's, who's, who's putting himself in harm's way. And so, you know, that was for me, my big shift when I was like, you got to remember, right. And you got to be grateful. And I have a second chance at life. Right. And I need to make the most of it. And, you know, for me, like my everyday carry, so to speak, is I carry the names and the faces and the memories of the great heroes, right. That we all know that paid the ultimate price. And that's how I, you know, I, I just shift my attitude, man. But for a while I was banging on my high chair because I was like, I can't go to war. I can't be with my boys. Like my life's pointless. When in reality, I, I, I reframed it so that I can still serve. I can still be a good example. I can still protect my buddies because when they get out, right, I can mentor them. Yeah. I'm still... And you got to get, get out and get to something. Well, yeah. How did you... Did you go through NICO or any kind of program that helped you get to that? So it was kind of like a, it was, it was a, it was a really bad situation, right? So I had all these traumatic brain injury issues, uh, and now COVID-19 was full, full bore, right? Everybody was like, all the programs were shutting down. It was like roll 30, roll 60, you know, you would be like, Hey, we're going to send you to NICO. We're going to send you to Intrepid Spirit. But then they'd be like COVID in California. I mean, they were rationing out meat. Like it was it was pretty weird. Everybody was on lockdown. So I couldn't get into those. Uh, I couldn't get into those uh, really uh, prestigious, uh, you know, brain yeah. uh, rehabilitative stuff. So, but I was doing everything I could, right? So essentially like it was, you know, I got, when we got back from that, that first pump, I just had a lot of issues and I, uh, it was like trading your hos your gun in, like to go be at a hospital and you know i don't know how long if you guys have ever been to a hospital but it's not in a positive place like mm -hmm. it's very depressing right and uh in the beginning yeah mm -hmm. so it switches because in the beginning when you're busted up it's the best place and yeah I, oh they're giving you and, drugs and, yeah and all i that. mean it's it's awesome and then when you heal up if you if you have to you don't want to recover in there. Mm -hmm. mm -mm, it's not a recovery. It's not a recovery. That's the, that's the difference. You'll, and that you'll, you'll feel it. if you've been in one long enough, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It just kind of eats at you. Yeah, and you know, for me, it was, it was just the pill stack, dude. It was pill after pill after pill after pill, yeah. and that's where, you know. And then I started having like these things called TI, like mini strokes, like TIAs, trans ischemic attacks, yeah. right? And, and uh, they they would really mess my speech up, and so it was just. Um, Dude, it was like one thing bad after another. So it was like I was there trying to get the help. The help really wasn't available, and the help that was there wasn't working. I felt like it was just making me worse, right? And, the, and then I lost. And at the same time, you like you lose your purpose, right? Uh, and then you know my my personal life was also falling apart at that time because most people they'll be your best friend when you're a team guy, active duty, or whatever, doing your thing, and then you have a setback. Like the best thing that ever happened to me was like I had a what I call total life reset, right? I was like this thing and had this title that people they'll respect me for, and that thing went away, and the inventory of people in my life also went away, right? And so it's crazy because that like I call it like hero to zero, right? I was like I went from this you know dude with a title status whatever, and then here I was like living in the back of my truck, like pretty much essentially a homeless veteran, no money, no purpose addicted to anti everything's anxieties antidepressants and um it was just like one bad thing after another and then i rebuilt my life when i went through alternative medicines and got the hyperbaric oxygen therapy did the ketamine therapy did all this stuff and then i rebuilt my life so i was a hero zero back to hero now i run this successful company where you know i'm getting my belts into the hands of people and then my phone's blowing up all the time now it's like hmm you know like where were you then man but you know, my thing is just, I try not to hold grudges, no blame, no anger, no nothing. I, I move forward 
you know, try to love everybody and anybody that I can and just try to be that good example and be kind of like the change I want to see. And I've applied that to like every little thing in my life, like with my business, with my my family 2.0, right? Yeah. Um, well, sometimes God puts you in situations and takes those people away from you for a little bit so you can struggle on your own. And it has nothing to do with your friends. Your friends still love you even mm -hmm. though you feel like they turn their back on you. Mm -hmm. But you're at that moment you weren't supposed to have them you were supposed to feel the struggle by yourself yeah and i'm a big believer in um like this mentality right every time you point your finger there's three more pointing back at you bro and every time you open your mouth and talk bad about somebody there's somebody talking bad about you mm -hmm. yeah i know that for a fact happens mm -hmm. and with the pharmaceutical training i told you it's like being a team guy's tough it never stops imagine buds is and I had to literally shift the way I thought mm -hmm. because of it. And PTSD is pharmaceutical training, standby for dosage. <laughs> That's a good acronym. Right? That's and very then accurate. pissed off, tired, stoned, and drunk comes yep. right after that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then once we make it through those cycles, it's almost like it, it was depressing to be pulled away from the team. So this is our morning cycle. Mm -hmm. I, that's the best way I could have acknowledged it. And it was just readily available. That thing. But what happens is it covers everything that you're supposed to. Like, imagine... Bud started, and then it doesn't stop till we get out. And I try to explain to civilians this mentality. Imagine walking into the gym one day and just working out for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And then right when they pull you out of it, you're going to be sore yeah. for a little while because you're trying to absorb all that. But instead of wanting to be sore, you take these pills to get mm -hmm. rid of the – it's still going to be there. Absolutely. It, yeah. It's still going to be there. So when, when we when we get done with that and that, that all clears up and then you find it, the fire – I remember when I wanted to become a SEAL, I had a fire like you couldn't believe. Yeah. I never had that again until here recently. Yeah. And it's kind of like a per you know when so you're supposed to do something. Mm -hmm. You freaking know it. Yeah. Especially team guys. You can't stop it. Everything you think of is about that. Obsession. Everything you put on, yeah. you obsess over it. Yeah. And the harder you try to ignore it, the more, the more, the harder it gets. Yeah. That's how you know you're supposed to be doing something. Yeah. And that's kind of like, kind of how we are i think we're all is we're all it's all very common to us it's like if this is the thing i'm going after then i will stop at nothing, nothing. to achieve that like even like you know and it's like even like just whatever we have to do no matter what even I, if you have to like you know yeah i don't die, know where that like, happens to us i don't know what phase that happens when they install that in us or when that gets turned on or what the mechanism is that activates mm -hmm. that but it's in every one of us yeah that drive and that's why when i find a team guy who's like starting a business or something i'm like dude you like get in with this Stand dude. By. it's gonna be successful especially if there's right. a couple of them yeah i mean if they you know you know how they are if they both all of them have the appetite for it yeah you can't it's just it's almost like we've just been waiting to see what you were supposed to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. These so guys are good. How did you get into the leather making or leather working? Yeah. So I, um, I grew up in the city. I didn't know what leather working was. Cowboys, Texas, Montana, Idaho, all these places like leather work is like a common thing. But when you grow up in the city, like you don't know like what that is. Right. It's uh, there's no cowboy culture there. So um, I was at that time in my life, I was absolutely broke. Right. I was shopping at the Salvation Army. And I was just standing in there, standing in line, and I saw like an old dog or an old belt on the rack, right? And I like looked at that, and I, for some weird reason, right, the the repurposed mind that we all have, I kind of looked at that uh, leather leather belt, and I was like, man, that could look like a really good dog collar, right? Because at the time I was in a pipeline for a service dog, so I wanted it to have like a beefy, cool collar, right? Oh, yeah. Bro, same thing happened to me, <laughs> yeah. man. And so I'm looking at that, I'm looking at that old leather belt, and I'm like, man, that that could look good. Uh, on a dog and so i i bought it right and i i took it back to where i was staying at the time and i you know i chopped it and i cleaned it with saddle soap and i i put a little bit of new hardware on there that i got from the arts and crafts store and i looked at it, i was like man this looks pretty good right and so i took a picture of it i was like i bet i could sell that i don't know it's like one thing like after the other right it's like i bet i could sell that i put it on a picture of it on instagram somebody bought it for me for like 45 bucks right. and i'm like Light bulb goes on because at the time, so here, here, my timeline was injured, uh, 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 COVID nineteen full bore, got ended up getting medically retired from the teams, into the civilian world. Nobody was hiring. Everybody was still on lockdown, so I couldn't find a job. So here I was, this, you know, I had something on my chest that meant I was something special, right, or whatever. Maybe I had an ego issue or whatever, but I couldn't find a job. Nobody wanted to hire me, right, because of all the turmoil going on in the in the United States at the time. And so I literally 
you know, the, when, it was during that time that I did this whole, you know, the dog collar thing. And I was like, oh, my man, I could I, I'm in business like <laughs> you sell, you know what I mean? I and, tore my closet apart looking for cool stuff to put around my dog's neck. Yeah. Just to make sure it looked like a teen guy. It was yeah, real yeah. Butt, tough. Uh, real same butt. thing. Yeah. So you could choke a dog off a bite oh, or something. Dude, dude. Man. <laughs> yeah. Dude. You know what I mean? I, yeah. That, that something happens to us. We, we think like that. Yeah. And I think for, and then, so for me, I was like, okay, start. So I started, dude, I went to every Salvation Army, Goodwill, thrift store. And I didn't know, like you go to a leather store and like buy a bunch of leather. Yeah, so right. I'm like doing it the hard <laughs> way, like going to all these old, old thrift stores and buying up. And dude, I had the crustiest, nastiest belts. I'd buy them, you know, I would go to, it got to the point where I was on like a first name basis with the guys at the Salvation Army. They would, they would, they would go through the donation bins. Dude, and, I bet the homeless people were pissed at you for a while. <laughs> Like you're taking they didn't even know. Belts. They got a damn belts around here. What the hell's going yeah. on here? People probably thought I was crazy, man. I had to walk over. Here with comes like, the belt guy. I'd have like 15 belts over my shoulder, and they're like the yeah. nastiest things, dude. Like an old go donated leather belt that's like 15 years old is nasty. So yeah. I would take those, and I was, you know, and so I was driving around and going to all these thrift stores, buying them up, and uh, that was my business model, right? And so the thing was, I would leather craft felt good to me, right? It was, you know, I'm a breacher, so like high RPM. Like machinery, it oh, gets yeah. me like jacked up. It, there's no peace there for me. So I started. Leathercraft was like quiet. I had a, if I was if I made a mistake, I could start over. And I had to beat myself up, right? And uh, and then so I was that was what I did. I sold dog collars on Instagram, and it was like it was just a way to like make money, right? It was like how I was living, and at the time I had no place to live, right? I was bouncing around my truck like living in like back of my truck right now part of that was i think i i did a, i created a lot of my own problems for myself just because i was i was just a mess right i was on a bunch of pills and kind of off my rocker and um but it buying those selling those dog collars and i could get into an airbnb right and i was like i wasn't sleeping in my truck anymore and i have to worry about security guards tapping on my window saying like hey you can't you can't sleep here right and so i got into that airbnb and it was like, boom. And I saw I'm running this business from like the kitchen table and the counters of these Airbnb people, right? Their, their counters are probably loose because I was hammering on them so damn oh hard. <laughs> and uh, then one of my buddies who's in, he's like, hey, man, can you make me a belt? I was like, okay, yeah, I can make you a belt. But I didn't know, like I couldn't just repurpose an old belt from Salvation Army. So I had to, at that point, it felt like I was like creating something for my brother, right? I was like back in it. And... Um, that was the thing. It felt like I was it's a different feeling, it. right? Yeah, it's a completely different feeling. When you're making something for your boy who's going to wear it's as completely a tool. different. That's yeah. what keeps mm -hmm. keeps us going too. There's there's when you go in, there's the initial feeling when you get accepted to something. Mm -hmm. Then there's a purpose in there while you're doing it, and then the, the more you stay in there, the more it grows. And someone comes in and, and asks for something. That's completely yeah. different. And then that obsession thing that you're and talking it, about it goes, switches wham. gears. Yeah. It switches gears. And so then I was like, man, so I made a belt for him like that he would wear. And I kind of took my own experiences from the teams and like, hey, what kind of con weather conditions is he going to put it through? How wh what's he carrying? Right. He's carrying a sidearm and all these different things, tools, dump pouches, all that. So I was like, I have to make a really beefy, sturdy leather belt for him. Then and so I, you know, I made him a belt. I sent it to him and then I snapped a picture, put it on my dog collar website. And then next thing you know, I sold like 10 belts in a day. And I was selling them at like a hundred dollars back then. And I'm like, I'm like, I, so I made like a thousand dollars in a day. Obviously half of it went to the government, but I was like, Hmm, they do that. light bulb, yep. light bulb. And so then I was like, man. And so that's like being a, I think being a team guy has helped me as an entrepreneur. You're always being fluid in how you adapt, right? You're. Oh, and you can see a little bit further ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, we started gobbling that stuff up. We were like, Oh, well he yeah, then there's probably something to this. Yeah. And that's where just like, you know, Semper Gumby, right? Always, always flexible, right? It's like, and so that's where you adapt to, you know, you adapt to whatever the battlefield needs. Yeah. And in entrepreneurship, it's the same thing. You adapt to whatever the needs of your customer base yeah. is. And so it was like, man, just like that, I became a belt business overnight. And I started, you know, and then I started, okay, now I'm a breacher. So let's go smash some things with this belt and show how tough it is or tow trucks or whatever. And so that's where the creative team guy process Brilliant. came. Yeah, just smashing, right. going Except to the junkyard, having the movie, fun. Get in the movie genres with that thing. Oh, Marcus, freaking! If there's a Mission Impossible skit. where Tom Cruise throws that oh, belt yeah. up over that wire, dude. dude. Goes like, you, you, I mean, yeah, hey, I told you, cliffhanger. You could make it into a skit. We sit here all day and write those down. Freaking loves it. That's why when I showed him your videos of you hitting the um, cinder block yeah, or yeah, whatever, yeah. like I would just buy. Like, I, obviously, team guys. Yeah. Two is one, one is none. Mm -hmm. But I would have a belt for every occasion. Yep. <laughs> Well, if you thing, sold it to me like you did those commercials you make, yeah, I, I was like, well, I got, 
you have one. I'm like, yeah, but I need that one to haul yeah. the, the truck with my waist. Right? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, for me, right, it was like where I really did well was I kept everything. I just always reinvested, right? I, and this goes back to the mentorship we were talking about in the beginning. Yeah, before you take for yourself, just kind of keep putting yeah, back in. And I, and I got two really great mentors, right? Their names are Jason Higgins and Andy Arbito. Andy Arbito runs Half Base yeah, Blades. Yeah, Arbito's great. Dude, yeah, and he... He was like my business mentor, and he's like, just keep reinvesting. He's like Team Guy Jesus. Yes, dude. He is Team Guy Jesus. I'm <laughs> forever. Jesus, man. Dude, I had a single. I had a Everybody, single. we all know who he is. I mean, One of these belts is 700 stitches, right? So I had a, a single stitch manual sewing machine clamped to the Airbnb, and I was sitting there, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, 700 times to make one of these, right? <laughs> And to, but but for me it's like hey, I that's like putting the work in, bro. Yeah, I'm sweating and it's good, and yeah. I'm like, I, but I need that like physical outlet in the the grinding steel, dude. Like I was a I was an A dub gunner, dude. I love yeah. just feeling of steel grinding and all that. And so, and I was Andy bought me. You know, I, I was just starting out. I had no money. I was in an Airbnb, right? Single stitch sewing machine. He bought me a uh, an automatic sewing machine that could, dude. I stitched. Oh, the team guys are great about that. Yes, dude. And he and it I is, paid him back as soon as they're I. They're freaking could. great about doing stuff yeah. like that. But I, I was able then to scale. I was able to scale my my business overnight. Right. It didn't take me, you know, uh, you know, it didn't take me forty five minutes to sew a single belt. Right. And I was in business. Yeah, but you know, now that you created this, when it comes time to pass it down, or it's coming, people, you'll be like, hey, look, I, this is what I had to do in the beginning. It yeah. just kind of sets a standard. That's really cool that he did that. Yeah, he's the man. I'm forever yeah. grateful to that guy. So it was, it was Andy, Jason Higgins, and then Eddie Gallagher really helped me out. I mean, he, oh, great you know, man. like those guys, man, like, and people don't know, like, the, they've been through a lot. Yeah. That crew you just talked, you just said. And, and they don't, they, you know, I was in such a bad situation, right? And those guys, like, they're that, that, like, the act of kindness they're them willing to support me got me to like sitting in this chair right now right mm -hmm. and so Man, that's what team guys do yeah i mean each one of us have to go through this freaking crazy ass trial and tribulation and then it's just because don't worry your buddy's got to go through theirs too yeah mm -hmm. yeah and my goal is to be there for them in that same yeah, yeah, regard same thing, that those guys were there for me so so what i did from moving on from that was i was like okay keep reinvesting so we're going to start building our own buckles but my thing was you know when when you go down range and you see the players going on in these proxy wars in these areas where we're at you like for me i didn't want to come home and, and be a sales a, a salesman for china i didn't want to source made in china screws hopefully we're allowed to talk about yeah. this on okay cool so um and so i was like how do i this make this made in america bro hell yeah cool <laughs> come on cool cool so uh so i was like i have to do 100 percent made in the usa right and so it's not the the supply chain is not available like straight up like the, it's hard because we we've done so much outsourcing, outsourcing in this country right? and so my thing was okay and then boom it's like now i got a mission dude i'm building the toughest belts in the world i'm sourcing 100 percent in usa i'm creating jobs right and so i figured out a way right every single thing in in my belts is made in the usa we get our our leather in the usa our our threads made in north carolina our buckles are made on these vintage world war ii automatic screw machines made in rochester new york and um you know and that that was for me like my and so i aligned like entrepreneurship making quality gear for people and putting america first and so now i had now i had purpose again right and so i as weird as it sounds right i was like mm -hmm. I, t I started a belt company and I figured out a way to continue serving through that by being a patriot centric entrepreneur. And my whole goal is that other people will see that it can be done. Like, look, dude, I'm I don't outsource anything. I'm 100 percent made in the USA. I'm a small business, but I you can be profitable by producing here in the USA. Mm -hmm. And that that's my my whole goal is like be the change oh, well, you want to hey, see. Especially the first ones doing. Imagine that we had that all here mm -hmm. and then it went away. Yeah. And remember how productive it was when it first when we first had it. Now the people who are coming in doing the all the American thing, mm -hmm. that, that's y'all are recreating something, and it's going to come back with a freaking vengeance. And it's bringing patriotism back. Like people actually care. Just because you decided to make a belt, how many people now have jobs and mm -hmm. across the country because of that? Yeah, and that's been for me how I continue serving and protecting. Right, and, and it, it takes a little bit of reframing. Yeah, sure. right? Absolutely. And, and although I would love to be sitting on a forty-seven with a with a gun in my lap with the boys. That that part of my that chapter of my life is over. But so how do I carry on yeah. being a good example, being the change I want to see, and still kind of living a life that I can be proud of, right? That and, and it's all about for me. It's all about legacy and generation, right? I want my son because I think the ways of production that entrepreneurs have kind of taken in in today's day and age um, have kind of resulted in where we're at now as a country, right? Where we're totally dependent, 
And my whole thing is, I don't believe in that model. Yeah, mm-hmm. independent. And so everybody told me when I was starting out, like, you know, like, hey, I want to be the largest manufacturer of, of 100% American-made belts in the, in the world. They're like, oh, you know, all my big business mentors, the guys that I pretty much had to, like, say, get out of here because they don't align with my views. You know, they were like, it can't be done. I was like, oh, it can be done, right? But all they wanted to do was outsource me to Mexico, yeah. China, these places. But I said, you know, um, you know, that's not that's not something that I can do. So we figured out a way to build our screws, build our parts, uh, and we sourced the finest quality leather in the world from two of America's oldest tanneries. And we use really badass American-made machines. Like some of our machines were literally used in World War II and... It's just cool to see like old machines mm-hmm. back in action. Yeah. And then you go to the junkyard, you smash a bunch of stuff. And so I was <laughs> not, Hunter was talking about about belts and, and why is it such a big deal. I'm like, hey man, when you get a freaking belt that you really break into, yeah. it's kind of like having a great pair of shoes or a great hat or something like that. Yeah. I've been wearing the mess out of this one, the one you gave me. Yeah. Trying to break that sucker in. And I got to tell you, <laughs> um, when you wake up in the morning and it's still holding this position, like you can jump into your pants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a hula hoop. A hula hoop. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really is. And you can, I don't know, if the Intimidator, I don't know if you have the name, one of the names for that, man, but if you Intimidator, that's going to be one. I'll if you beat the dog shit out of somebody with his damn that, thing, That's the whole thing, right? It's like, as a team guy, I'm always looking at what's a weapon. So I figured out a way. Bro. Yeah. Man, when I latched this thing on, the front, the funniest thing, the first thing that hit me, I was like, oh, you can carry a holster with this. Yeah. And a pistol. Yeah. Easy. You don't have that that wedge that forms down there mm-hmm. or bites in. Yeah, yeah. It's that was easy and a blade. Yeah, and that's where no not skimping on. It's like if I was a breacher and I gave you a charge, I was like, Marcus, this charge is good to go. It yeah. had to be made like to my standards. And I've been wearing this a while trying to break it in, and it ain't. It'll it'll go eventually. But I'm just saying that's good. Yeah, and my whole thing, right, is like you build something that will last a lifetime, right? And so I think a lot of people are kind of getting sick and tired of this, uh, you know, the, the Amazon model of business where you buy something cheap, but it's crap and you have to buy a new one yeah, in eight months, one. right? And yeah. so- Something that, should be made to last. Something should, right? And, and that's my biggest thing is that, you know, a good quality leather belt will last you a lifetime. And so it's kind of weird. Like I never thought like I would be running a belt company it's like the weirdest like i know too much about men's hips dude like (laughs) like, that's the thing it's like man so you're in men's hips is that what you're telling me yeah that's great Uh, i'm in the business of that uh really close friends and teammates uh his he has a belt story he was active duty in the teams um but on a hunting trip like a just on a break he went on a hunting trip in san antonio and he was on an ATV by himself at like four in the morning going from one lodge to another and it rolled, cut off mm. his arm. Tourniqueted himself. He turn he did the tourniquet with his belt. Mm. And he has this story that like that uh the ne- the when he was packing, he almost packed a different belt and he was like, No, I need this this belt's like my trusty belt or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he put it on. If he would have worn the other belt, it wouldn't have um, given enough to be able to be a tourniquet. Mm -hmm. That saved his life because he was by himself. His phone had flown off the ATV. Couldn't find it. He had to walk like three miles to the lodge. One of the best stories ever. Yeah. And um, it was too cloudy for a life flight. They Mm -hmm. had to drive him to the hospital. And um, anyway, the belts ended up saving his life. So every time I think of a belt, I'm like, you have to have a good belt because what if... (laughs) What if you're gonna lose something? You yeah. need it for a tourniquet. That's my mind always. Team guys think like that. that too. Yeah. It's like what about what, 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 yeah. what would that be cool for? What do I carry on that? And my thing is like a belt. It's, it's more than just something that keeps your pants up, right? It's a versatile tool for everyday life. Dude, and you, you can yeah, you, yeah, you can smash. You can rescue a hot dog out of a car. <laughs> you know, smash the window open. I mean, but uh, you know, and so that. The coolest thing about it, though, is like this whole thing that I've created, dude, I started with, I started a business with $41 straight up. Like I bought a Shopify subscription. It was like 15 bucks. I bought the domain name, right? At the time I was running, that was like $12. I bought some stuff, arts and crafts supplies, and I bought a $1 belt from Good Goodwill or Salvation Army. And it, 
it ended up being like 41 bucks. So I took, a, I started a f with $41 and now I hit a million dollars in revenue. Have you taken this to the teams to get the government contract on that yet? So there's a process for like bidding on that and, and, and kind of like getting your... So you can't just drive out in the front like the coffee shop ladies do and be like, hey, come get your damn belt so <laughs> yeah. you don't have to go through the process? Well, my, my Cause you know thing, they'd walk right out and do that. Yeah, well my thing is, is I'm, I'm a newer company, right? I've only been around for two and a half years and so I'm, I'm getting the belts to the who, right? Getting it in well, the Well, you know hands. what you need to do, man? We need to go get an old Cadillac. Like a big one, and put some, hang a bunch of belts from the trunk, and then, oh and then dress up like old team guys. And when the new guys are walking in, just open up the trunk, and be like, "Get your belt!" <laughs> like and, yeah. gold oh, feet. you know that would sell. Yeah, I mean, oh team God. guys eat that up. Yeah, it's a, for for us, it's a harder sell because it's a more expensive item, right? But it's 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 quality and like the team fact that you care. can. They got money to burn, you know that. Yeah, you're they, right. they, they, <laughs> the, they will wait if it's good, if it's cool looking. Yeah, the team guy will buy it. Yeah. But this belt is for everybody. It can be for your traditional cowboy. It can be for yep. just any businessman going to work. Yeah, look, if we wear it, everybody else will too. Yeah, it's. Yeah, and that's my my goal, right? Is like I want to be I, I want to be the largest distributor of men's leather belts. It's a very weird, very specific goal, <laughs> right? And I, and, I, which and, I know <laughs> nothing about, so I'm glad you're yeah, here, bro. Yeah, dude. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> but we got a team guy and everything. You're like, hey, you might got a belt, dude. Yeah, yeah we do. We, yeah, got, we a got a guy. belt guy. So. And that's my thing, dude, is like, I, I literally wake up in the morning and like I, people used to tell me, you know, do what you love and the money will come. Right. And I like every morning when I wake up, like, dude, I love making belts. It's the weirdest thing. dude. Good, it's man. so weird. And I'm not really proud of it, but no, it should be. But yes. and so that that's the thing, right? It's a like a leather man, worker, man. That, I mean, that's you should be. Yeah. And I and I really do like I, and so that's the thing. Like, I love what I'm doing and I wake up every morning excited to do it because I'm giving people a really high a really quality item and it brings me that piece that I need right because dude like making leather belts I'm like you know your VA gives you your your like your suicide prevention plan like number 1 for me was go make go do leather craft right and that so it there's a therapeutic aspect to it and so my goal what I would like to do is have a bunch of veterans I believe in the artistic creative side right for for guys like us yeah. um who need that quiet between the ears yeah, right yeah, for this something. thing to shut off to be working with your hands uh, and that's really, you know, working with your hands, living a quiet life. And like you said earlier, like God puts you through hard times, people coming out of your life, right? Like Romans eight twenty eight, all things work for the glory of those who love God. And at the time when you're like in the hurricane, in the storm, you're, you know, you're shaking your fist at the sky being like, what the heck, man? But it's like everything bad that I had to go through mm -hmm. led me to like where I am right now, which is sitting in a chair in front of Marcus Luttrell <laughs> and you guys. And it's like, man, yeah. like if you could have told me that like, like two and a half years ago, dude, I was sleeping in the back of my truck and like now I'm here and it's just, it's amazing, right? And I think it's a miracle. And it's because I had to like abandon my own way and my own understanding and I had to like rebuild on the rock, right? And put my faith first. And when I lost confidence in my own ability to do what was what I thought was right, because I was still in fight or flight or whatever it was, yeah. when I when I kind of like buried my old self, right? And, and, and put on this new way and I like rebuilt on, on the word, right? Everything fell into place. And it was crazy to me, you know, and hopefully we don't offend people talking about religion, but uh, really for me, <laughs> dude, it was my saving grace, right? And when, when times for me got hard, I would focus on, you know, Jesus' sacrifice for me, dude. And mm -hmm. like, I wasn't a believer. Like, I, I call it inter eternity insurance shopping, right? When you're when you're in some country that people don't know we're in and you're going on some operation that you could maybe, you know, this could be your last ride. You start searching for what's next, right? You start looking through, like, you know, studying the different religions. So like, I wasn't, I wasn't a, you know, I wasn't saved by any, by any chance, right? I was in need of God. So I cried out to him in that time of my life. But when I got back to comfort, I was went back to my old ways. Right. But I really had to come to like the end of myself mm -hmm. to realize that my way and my understanding wasn't, wasn't working. And I had to make, you know, and that's where I go back to the, every time you point your finger, there's three more pointing back at you. It was me, right? I had to make the changes to turn my life around. And I did. And that's why I put John 316 on every box, right? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. And on my worst days, dude, that's what I did. I focused on every detail of, you know, Jesus walking up that hill, mm -hmm. right? Carrying that cross, dragging in the ground, digging into his shoulder, right? We know pain, you know what that's like. And to just, and it shifted my perspective, right? When I was sitting there with a bottle of pills, 
sleeping in the back of my truck with a loaded pistol thinking like, you know what, two years, two, two years ago, I was doing, you know, working with the highest tier of guys in the country that very few people know we're at. And now I'm in the back of a wall. I'm sleeping in my back of my truck. My world is just wrecked. Like, what's the point? Why should I keep going? Right. Mm -hmm. And I get because I get I thought I I, inv I was invested in the linear path to success. Right. I went to college, was a good kid, went to go be a team guy. And now I had this 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 thing in my mind that was trying to break me. Right. And uh, and that was how. I had to learn a new way, dude, because I get I came to the end of myself yeah. and you know, I did all the alternative medicines and those kinds of things. And, but for me, the, my saving grace was putting my, giving my life to Jesus and, and, and going all in on that. Mm -hmm. And I'm here today because of that straight up. I'm not here today because of, you know, some of the different therapy models definitely bought me time, right. To like get healthy and get well, but it was my faith that mm -hmm. allowed me to humble myself and yeah become new right i feel That's... like the medicine will get you to a point of clarity to where you can search for your faith and really delve into it and understand yes. like the true meaning of it mm -hmm. but you have to have that discipline in your faith to keep going mm -hmm. it's not just the alternative medicines that will keep you going that's just going to well, get yeah. you to point a well there's a difference between you carrying it and it carrying you yep mm -hmm. i mean and, and if you don't know that there's there's a weight that comes with that, mm -hmm. like a, a heavy weight. And they say, hey man, when you everyone has their cross to bear, what are you gonna let it? Carry? You gonna pick it up and carry it? Mm -hmm. Like we all get saddled with something. Yep. But if if you know that though, and you know that it's your job, once you carry it, it, it changes everything. Yeah. Like there's a feeling that goes with it, and yeah. everyone, no matter what you're doing, what environment you're in, what drug you're trying to take, you're going after a feeling. Mm -hmm. And when you when you patch up with the boss, man, when Jesus gets a hold of you, it don't go away. Yeah. And all the rest of that crap goes away. Yeah. But there's a feeling that comes with this one, man, that doesn't. And I'm talking about from the time you get up to the time you freaking go to bed, and it don't care what you're doing now. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's if you know you're supposed to be there, like if you know you're everyone in the I just told him this. I teach my kids this. Everyone to get up and show, I'm like, tell me where to go, who to see, what to say, and what to do. Mm -hmm. And in that way, no matter what I'm in, I'm covered. Yeah. I don't care if I had to insult you. Hey, bro, that wasn't me. That was the boss doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Yeah, that's the mentality of you get into. Yeah, absolutely. And it helps because we don't have that in the beginning. No, dude. If I knew this when we were back in things, I don't know if I. I don't know. I'd be. You'd be. I'd be different at least. I'd have been, I mean, well, things would have been different. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't want to have fear first of all, which I think was important to have for a little for some of us. Mm -hmm. well, I think there's timing for every everything like all the phases in life it all happens when it's supposed to happen oh yeah i guess you, you know what if you want to be a belt maker we're trying to be seals yeah <laughs> now, that's the thing man like to compare the two yeah, right like yeah, I, I i'm I like that i'm like man all i do is make belts now and it, there's that side to it right but for me right i i, I know that like god has a plan for my life mm -hmm. um and he's put this passion in my heart right or given me this skill uh and so you know when like when you're like trying to find God's purpose for you, right? I, right now for me, I can say like my, my purpose feels like I make the best belts in the world and I use my my business and my personal story as a vehicle for the gospel message, right? Mm -hmm. And that is um, how I redeemed myself or I was redeemed through putting my faith in, in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to share that with other people, right? And it it has affected my business in some regard, but in reality, it's like when you when you are living for the next life, right? There's nothing there's nothing here any longer that can break you, mm -hmm. right? You you know I could say you become unbreakable when you you're you're 100 paid up and your eternity insurance is is in God, right? And um and that for me is my message, and I use my business as a vehicle for that, right? And that's my goal: be the change you want to see, be a patriot, build a good product. Tell a good, uh, you know, your reputation, even though the uniform comes off, right? Your reputation is our currency. Oh, that still rolls in, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your your reputation, even though the uniform comes off, still goes, right? So, yeah. like, that question for me, and I think every team guy always lives, lives by, is like, how do you want to be remembered, right? That's why we're hard on the, the guy still in. Yeah. That is, Trident is a recognizable thing. Mm -hmm. And that and that title, that SEAL title, you throw that down on anywhere on the planet, then it, it's like when somebody walks in and says they're a doctor. Mm-hmm. 
I don't care what they look like. As soon as you hit them with that doctor tag, everyone's like, oh, oh okay, you know, there's there's always something in there. Yeah. Same way with the seal tag. Mm-hmm. So once you once you straddle that up, so what comes with that is expectation. Yeah. So they expect that to be a certain way. It better last, better be tough, better look good, cool. Yeah. You know, feel good, the whole thing. And I think, too, you know, there's an expectation that a lot of guys get out and they maybe like they go to Stanford and they, you know, they but there is a large there's a group of guys. I don't want to speak for the majority, but that when when they that that new purpose, finding that new purpose, there's there's some struggling. There's some healing. Oh, that absolutely. Needs yeah, we got that to happen. And so uh, and that was for me was, you know, I wanted to, you know, whether it's like be vulnerable, but I wanted to share like, hey, where were my total failures in my life? What what led up to that? And like, how can you not make the same mistake that I did? Yeah, I don't know what propagates that, why some of our guys go into that, you know, go straight to Stanford, become doctors, orthopedic surgeons. I mean, we got them across the board. Yeah, amazing group of people. It's unbelievable. And then, and it's, and it's not the guys you think. Mm. And then we got the guys who come in out, and, and they something happens to them, and, I, and they get stuck in in that dark place by the by themselves. Mm-hmm. And it's the guys who wouldn't think about doing that. That's one of the problems. You're like, yeah. oh, he's good, dude. He wouldn't go there. Yeah, and it, those are the guys you got to worry about. Yep. And like, yes, they would. If a team guy can get into something, he will. Yeah, he, he just will. Because mm-hmm. he just gets bored. Yeah, simple boredom. Yeah, and that you know, for me, is like kind of what I try to do is is. Ch- change a little bit of the conversation being had. And part of that is like maybe embarrassing myself, right? With, 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 with my failures and being honest with people about, Hey, like these are the mistakes that I made. Uh, and that's my whole thing is like, give people, you know, or at least for the people who know my story show like the part that you, you're not your highlight reel, right? Everybody wants to show oh, the highlight no. reel all the time. But for me, I'm like, and my whole goal to do that is to show that one guy struggling, whether whatever branch of that is a team guy highlight reel. We don't want to see the good stuff. We know what the cool stuff looks like. Yeah, Yeah. we want to see that other stuff. Yeah, I mean, we're we're magnificent at that Mm -hmm. because you're trying so hard. Yeah. So when we screw up, man, it looks great. I mean, it's something to watch, and people feed off of that, man. I mean, I'm look at me. I made a living off getting my ass kicked. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. (laughs) So how, what's your plan to grow? How are you going to get the word out? And to- So I'm a kind of like, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got, right? Continue to invest in, in quality. I believe if you produce a quality item, it'll drive quantity, not the other way around. I, you know, I, I still haven't taken any outside money. I still haven't taken any on, taken on any investors. So my biggest thing is just like most team guys, we want to get there. We want to get there now, right? Yeah. And so for me, it's all about, you know, a continuation of building that reputation, right? Slow, slow is smooth. Yeah, slow is smooth. Absolutely. <laughs> and just like I've always, inv- when I, when I dumped everything back into the business, okay, you find ways to do things faster without sacrificing yeah. quality. I don't right? know why we do that. We do it. And, and so that, that's kind of, you know, my long-term plan is, you know, be able to eventually make enough money. You own out, you own your building outright. You've got a bunch of veterans working because I believe in the therapeutic aspect of leather craft, right? And uh, we're just a, a, a badass American-made brand. Yeah. Um, part of that is just, I think what I've done has gotten me like to where I am now. So I'm going to keep doing that, keep finding good mentors, right? Um, and keep just producing the best that I can. And Do you think you'll expand to other leather goods like wallets or other stuff? Or will you stick to belts so I, my thing is like, I want to be the best in the world at making belts. Isn't that Belt. weird? Isn't no, that weird? No, I like it. I like keeping. <laughs> hey man, I, I completely agree with that. I saw, you know, I was walking by, I saw a Whataburger sign the other day that said they had hot wings. I'm like, why in the hell? <laughs> yeah. I, I stopped there yes, the two days ago to try it out. It's our health food store. Yeah. You got to get a Whataburger, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, there's a Bucky's right over Anti- here. Hit that and get some Blue Bell ice cream. That's a Texas hat trick. You're good to go, man. Yeah. Well, leave, leave a belt in there. My whole, my, How my. How you get put your belts in Bucky's? Uh, Bucky's? Yes. That they, place is amazing, dude. Bucky's like, stuff's oh, it's, a lot of all American You have to visit. Stuff. Yeah. It's like the Alamo, you know, that's the first place you gotta go that's what texas is about yeah we got okay buckies. we're gonna work on that okay yeah. well my thing what i what my my hope is right my if i had like one goal it would be to peel back the complex complex complexity of being an entrepreneur it's not that difficult if you're willing to work hard work smart right and take care of people right you know 
business is all about re- your relationships with yeah. people, providing that customer service. But I want to show, like, dude, I built a million dollar business with forty one dollars. You can do it too. I'm nobody special. It's not complicated. All I did was I work hard. I found a niche. Yep. You need to start a show. Not in the way they got the Shark Tank, Seal Tank. I went on Shark Tank, dude. You I, did? Hey, yeah. They didn't take me. <gasps> They didn't take me. Oh, so, well, here we are, man, oh, right dude. here. Welcome to the SEAL tank. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, went, I flew out there. I stood in line for like six hours. You know, I did my pitch and all that because I heard another team guy who started a, you know, a bottle over company. He made like his episode aired. He made a bunch of money. And I was like, man, I if I could do that, right, then you kind of you get your what. So I went there. I did my little pitch and all that, but they didn't. I didn't make it. So. It was, you know, but it was good because... I mean, uh, it's like someone kicked off a voice, dude. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. yeah, you turn out to be the best there is. So do it. you want to do... Are you ever going to get to a point where you do want your belts in, like, fine men's stores? Or are you just wanting to do You're straight the only warehouse. to... But are it's you going to do straight to consumer? Only? Yeah, so r- right now we're direct to consumer. I think with dis- distribution, right, a lot of people, they want to stock a Chinese good because the margin is higher there, right? And so for us, because... We, I mean, we build every single part. There's 14 precision machine parts in our belts. Yeah. That there's, there's not that, that, that margin of like, if I was like outsource and get them made in Mexico for $12 a pop and then put them in the store for 50 bucks, mm-hmm. I can't do that. So my goal is to definitely, um, you know, like five year plan would be to be in a, be in a store or, or do those. Or well, keep it random things. to where you have to find these things. Yeah. Like if you know, you know, kind of deal. Right. Like yeah. for whatever reason, they were in this store in this state during this year, but then they don't have them the next. I don't know. Just oh, Marcus loves. Bro, you things. know me, man. I'll come up with some he stuff. He loves like, yeah, some scavenger believe. hunt. And kind like, of they'll search for those things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then buy all of them at one time. Yeah. I, that's what I would do. I, I mean, as a consumer, I look for, for fun stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's crazy because it's like, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, what is what does everybody need, right? What is a you know, and, and like everybody needs a belt. Everybody needs right? a damn everybody belt. Everybody needs man. another belt, and then you need a black black one, brown one. They've yeah. got new shoes. shoes. You need one to match those, and then your girl needs a belt. That's right. Make it. her make her closet smell better with the leather. Oh it's yeah, a dude. For everybody. Okay, so one thing, like I had mentioned earlier, you do the commercials with you hitting the cinder block and breaking yeah. it. Would you be willing to do that here with Marcus? Absolutely. Let's string it up. I got one okay, out there. we've got it. one out there for us to film. Okay. And have Marcus whip a cinder block. Damn! You need to be careful. It'll blow back, cut your hand up. See like this right here? Those are all. Oh, you've actually been wounded. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> oh, yeah. This There's is a couple of times I hit like cattle oh, fences your came around. For sure. This is this is a bit. If you've taken. You've, if you've bled. bled for it. Bled, dude. You've bled, bled for this thing. Yeah. That's all it takes. It's, uh, yeah, so. Congratulations, man. I didn't know that. Yeah. Way no. to go. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. So. Let's do That's it. All, yeah, okay, so bit. where can our followers yeah. uh, find you? How can they buy the belt? Yeah, so if you go to macbelts.com, uh, www.m-a-c-k, and then belts. Uh, social media, Mac Belts. I do a lot of marketing on LinkedIn. That's kind of like where my business has thrived, right? My individual story yeah. from... Uh, so I do a lot of that on LinkedIn. So we're pretty much everywhere on social media. Just type in Mac Belts, and you'll see some weird guy in some blue jeans hitting some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it. it. Yeah, that's good, well, man. Thank you. Great, hey, great job, man. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for gonna... your service, man. No, I mean, thank we're, you, we're brothers. For your service. This is the Team Never Quit Podcast. Podcast. So buckle up, Buttercup. <laughs> <laughs>